everybody. I think um, I think we're going to get started with everybody to take a seat. Uh, my name is Krista. I am Senator Ball's Legislative Director. Thank you so much for coming tonight and being involved citizens in this very important issue. Um, just on a few notes, we do have some other local elected officials who knew that it's important to be here tonight. We have Lewisboro Councilman Jan Welsh. We have um, Supervisor Charlie Duffy. We have Supervisor-elect Peter Parsons. And we have Assemblyman Castelli. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. I also was asked to announce that if you are looking to get more involved on the issue of hydrofracking, that the Lewisboro Sustainability Committee is looking for new members. And you can contact Councilman Welsh, correct? All right, and also on another note, please sign in. I know that there is another sign-in sheet going around, and if you sign in, we will make sure that you are updated on the most, you know, on top breaking news uh, regarding whether it's legislation or, you know, regarding any new news on hydrofracking. So um, without any ado, I would like to introduce uh, New York State Senator Greg Ball. Thanks, Krista, thank you so much. <laughs> So I want to thank everybody for uh, for being here. Um, the way I figured, I'll give the presentation. If there are any tough questions, Assemblyman Castelli will answer them. If there are any softballs, I'll answer them. And, and uh, Bob, if you want to come up and join me once we actually start getting into the um, uh, question and answer. How many people have, have um, seen me speak on fracking before? Just so I have a okay, good. So I, but many of you haven't. Um, to give you a little background, why the hell does a Republican from Putnam County care about fracking? I got to have a hidden motive, right? Right? Um, let me tell you a little bit about, about me, okay? Um, I grew up uh, on a little tiny farm uh, in Pauling. And uh, I literally uh, raised, naturally raised pigs, goats, chickens, cows, everything. I made my own cheese, sold it, made my own raspberry jam, won the ball canning award. And it wasn't only because of my last name. Um, that's a joke, but um, raised organic chickens, had a two acre market garden off the cheese, sold the cheese and took the whey, raised, raised the pigs off the whey. The most amazing pork chop you're ever going to have, except for the pork chop at Modern Barn, which is even better than anything I raise. That's because it's a heritage breed. Um, so that's my background. That's what that's what's in my that's what's in my heart and my soul. And uh, eventually, when I uh, am no longer in politics, which maybe sooner sooner than later, uh, there there is life outside of politics. There are more important things to do than being uh, always in politics. You know, uh, there is a, other stuff to accomplish. Uh, one day, uh, whether it be at the end of my life or somewhere in the middle, I will get back into farming because that's what I absolutely love. Uh, it's a it's a tough horrible uh, business at times. Uh, it's very tough to make a living, we all know that. Um, but it's in my heart and soul. So when I, in Albany, as a legislator, as, you know, uh, trying to be a responsible legislator, as Bob will tell you, on this issue, those on who are pro-fracking would come in, the industry would come in, and give a very compelling story. Uh, almost to the point in literally suggesting, look, you can bathe in this stuff, you can drink this stuff, saying this, okay? Now since that time, I've asked them to follow through on that, and they refused to drink the fracking fluid. <laughs> That's a true story, and I, I had a state center, we were in um, a special session. A very you know, pro-fracking guy. And there's this interesting component going on there as well, which you all should know. We're beginning to win this debate, okay? Um, the concerns are becoming real, and even those that are pro-fracking are beginning to realize the need for absolutely stringent uh, regulations. I think even those on the, and six months ago that wasn't the case. But I was sitting next to a state senator, a special session, and uh, we were having a conversation. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, well, will you drink the stuff? And he said, absolutely. And, and then I said, well, do you mind if I tweet it right now? And he's like, well, wait, 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 don't, don't do that, don't do that. And uh, so pulled, you know, pulled back uh, uh, very quickly. So I think that even those that are very ardent supporters of fracking itself are beginning to realize, you know what, there's stuff going on in, in other states. So back to me, when I, when I met with the industry, uh, guys in suits from a multi-billion dollar industry, you would think that fracking was the magical cure for everything in the United States. And really, we were on the precipice of something great. And then the anti-frackers would come into my office, and quite honestly, they never looked like people that I saw uh, camp, you know, volunteered in my office. Uh, you know, it wasn't exactly my base coming in that was anti-fracking. Uh, it was folks that you know probably voted against me and tried to twice, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Uh, but they would, you know, they would talk about this issue, and a couple times they brought in sportsmen, they brought in farmers from other states. 
And that hit home. And I said, you know what, I've got to go, I've, I've got to go see this firsthand. Because it's so diametrically opposed, who's telling the truth? And there is a lot of misinformation out there. When I went to Pennsylvania, uh, and I saw firsthand what's happening in Pennsylvania, it became very clear to me that anybody on either side of the aisle, whether it be the governor, or whether it be Republican upstate senator, or New York City Democrat, anybody who saw it firsthand would realize, at the very least, we have to put the brakes on it. Uh, this is an industry that needs to be regulated, and that, quite honestly, anybody, uh, and mo you know, most folks that I've met in politics have a good heart, they would not want to see what happened in Pennsylvania happen in New York, bar none. And that's why I've asked legislators to go and see it. And we are getting more legislators to go. That's why I've asked the governor to go uh, and go see it. But when I met uh, w with farmers in Pennsylvania and I talked to those farmers, and, and one in particular story I tell is a woman who, she had 11 cows that freshened. You know what that means? That means they had baby calves, right? When a goat has a baby, what do you call it? What does she do? She kids. Kidding, kids. right? Exactly. Good job. Okay. <laughs> Just testing you. That's okay. Do you know that goat's milk is naturally homogenized because the fat globules are that small? Do you know that? Anyways, you don't care. <laughs> right. That, that's a totally other, don't even get me going on that. So anyways, when I met with her, she had 11 cows of fresh. She had, she had a piece of property, was told, okay, you're, you know, the, look, the, the farming industry is very tough. And we're seeing it upstate. People just signing away their lives because any revenue stream sounds good. So they signed away on the contract to the industry. They don't even have a, an actively fracked well. Uh, they're not seeing revenue come from that. It's totally disrupted their life. It's totally disrupted their business because there's a lot of industrial activity going, even though it's not being actively fracked. And there was a spill. And the cows didn't even drink directly from that contaminated source. They ate the grass far away. And there was contamination. Mm -hmm. Out of those 11 cows, what town was it in Pennsylvania? Oh, okay. Okay. I drove five hours. I didn't know where the hell I was most of the time. I'll tell you, but I mean, it was a, it was a, it was eye-opening experience. You talk about beautiful country, bucolic country, absolutely gorgeous country. And out of those eleven cows at Freshen, what was it? I was just saying Susquehanna County. Okay. Um, out of those eleven cows at Freshen, eight of them, she was pulling dead babies, dead calves out. Just that numbers-wise, if you have any farm experience whatsoever, it makes no sense whatsoever. So that's the type of stuff. People can say whatever they want. That's the type of stuff that moves me. And that's the type of stuff that I know that if people saw it firsthand, responsible legislators and this governor, they'd put the brakes on it as well. So this is the deal. I'm gonna, this presentation is not mine, okay? This is a presentation that was given by the Pennsylvania Executive Director of the Fish and Boat Commission. Fish and Boat Commission. John Arway. So the Fish and Boat Commission, not exactly a liberal democratic organization. Okay? And this organization is under the governor's purview. So they're appointed by the governor. But they're a wholly independent uh, organization um, and very well connected to the sportsman's community. This presentation that was given, we're going to make sure that every single legislator has a copy of this. And we're going to have him actually come to Albany. And we're looking to get legislators who are both pro-fracking and anti-fracking to sit in a room, no media, if that's what they want, sit in a room and have him give this presentation. Shell also sent a representative that gave this presentation. It was a very interesting presentation. It was basically, we take water, we, we force it into the earth, these bubbles come out, and everybody's okay. Um, so we'll probably have him come and give his presentation as well, and then we'll uh, have this presentation uh, next. So we'll get started uh, on this. If you have any questions, there may be certain questions that I can't answer, because I'm not you know, a subject expert. We can get you the information on that. Otherwise, I should be able to, to handle it. And Kristen may have moved the slides around, so. <laughs> Is it working? Are we okay? Joe, you almost got fired. Okay, so. Now this is, you have to understand this from the Pennsylvania perspective, and the, and the value in this is that the slides that you're gonna see, this is real stuff that's happening real time right now in Pennsylvania. So if New York State moved forward in the way that, that many people in the industry uh, wanted us to. Magnify your voice in some way. I have never been asked that. I love you, thank you so much. Um, okay, so, so this is from a Pennsylvania perspective, okay? Um, so always remember that when you're thinking, this is what's happening in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania said, we're gonna frack right now, forget about the regulations, which is what they wanted to do in New York. 
So the challenges for the industry is that there's no one stop shopping for approvals, um, foreign environmental regulations, and it's a new landscape compared to, to out west. For the public, a lack of information, as we all know, uh, and, and misinformation. For the regulators and resource agencies, and I think this is fundamentally important because this is exactly what we're up against in New York, especially during these budgetary times, limited staffing and outdated statutory regulatory authority. Okay, next. You can just, when it goes. Okay, so the environmental risks associated uh, with hydrofracking, whether it be in Pennsylvania or here, but this is specific to Pennsylvania, uh, geoseismic surveys, habitat fragmentation, access road construction, the well pad development itself, drilling, uh, water withdrawals, taking the water out, 10 billion gallons a day, every single day in Pennsylvania, and that's a, public, that's a publicly held, or you want to call it a commodity, a natural resource. <clears throat> water storage, huge issues there. Uh, Hydrofracturing itself, the industrial process, the waste disposal, what do you do with it? There were just hearings on that issue that's not even close to being solved. <clears throat> Pipeline construction uh, and the compressor stations. Okay, this is Pennsylvania. These are the permits right now. Right now. And this is, is not even a mere percentage of the, of the fracking that you're going to see in Pennsylvania. Next. These are the pipelines. I mean, it looks like a rail yard that are cutting through miles and miles and miles of territory uh, in Pennsylvania. These are the pipelines that are, that are transporting the commodity. Okay, now this, this, the, so these are, these are high, this is the best in the best, okay? Um, these areas, so the, the areas that you see in these colors, the best in the best, absolutely pristine natural resources and water. And if you look at where they're clustered, it's a same, can you just go back quick to the ones with the dots on the permits? It's two back. Yeah, see those dots? Now click quick to the, yeah. That's where they are. Okay, now the, this is pristine, absolute, highest rank, best of the best water sources. Go to the next. So they conducted this organization that's not a, it's not frack action, it's not, this is a totally independent organization uh, with the public good in mind uh, that conducted this. From to November 2009 to February 2010, they conducted a study of 175 sites within an eight mile area of a water course, those water courses, okay? The water quality related problems were recorded at approximately 30% of the sites. So right now in Pennsylvania, if you take that as a sampling and you, you trust you know, that sampling, 30% of the sites right now have some form of contamination. So people that talk about, oh this is, that the industry continuously says two things. One, they say th these are overblown suggestions that we're just saying the sky is falling. The other thing they say is all this stuff is naturally occurring in the water already. So when they tell you that the, it's limited, this is a sampling size that's, that's pretty spot on. It's at 30%. Krista, go to the next. You can switch over. Water quality, the water quantity issue, which we haven't even talked about in New York State. Stream and wetland encroachment, which we'll see a little bit. Erosion and sediment controls, and then the cumulative impacts of all that. Go to the next. So what are they seeing? They're seeing spills, okay, into to pristine uh, uh, trout streams and otherwise. Uh, serious fish kills, not only because of the contamination, but the, Im the importation of uh, algae from areas like uh, Texas and Colorado. And now all of a sudden it's in southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, illegal discharges, groundwater contamination, surface water contamination, and stream sedimentation. And once that groundwater is contaminated, to try to rect that, rectify that situation is nearly impossible. Next. Okay, so what are we talking about? You can drink this stuff, right? You ready? I got a gallon of it. Okay, surfactants, so soap, that kind of stuff. Um, I used to drink a lot of that growing up. My mom made sure of that. Organics, your typical organics that you're gonna see part of this process. Uh, TDS, totally, to, totally wow. dissolved solids, okay? Metals, chlorides, metals, uh, and we're talking about barium, strontium, selenium, uh, and then the radiums. Radium, gross alpha, uranium, radon. This is the stuff that they're seeing in the 30% in contamination. This is what they're finding in, in, when they're testing those, those areas. Next. Okay, now I gotta get to my notes. This, this is a spring uh, where, they, uh, where there's a contamination and it is right above um, a brook tr uh, stream that has um, uh, brook trout. And this blew out. There are actually injuries that were caused uh, at this site. And if you keep flipping, Christy, you go to the next one. Right now, this is the test that was done. Right now, this is it here. 
This still continues to flow polluted. So this is before you saw the picture. The reason why it's this color is I guess they, they have some sort of lime treatment that they've applied to it. Now this is an entirely pristine area. It's in one of those high value, high quality water source areas. This is going to be polluted and running down, downstream, downhill, downslope into a, a um, trout stream for eternity. This is left in the middle of the woods, continuing to, to pour out pollutant. Next. This is a spill, you talk about the surfactants, this is actually um, a spill that, for, uh, that happened from a pond that had been breached. Uh, there was too much rain, uh, they had uh, runoff from it, and this went into another tr trout stream in the state. This is considered to be the best uh, trout stream in the state. Go to the, go next. Now, this is what, <laughs> this is what they're cleaning up uh, the brine, the fracking fluid with. I mean, you, you couldn't even have something like this in Lewisboro, right, Charlie? I mean, I mean, damn, you'd run these people out of town. I mean, this is what they're using to clean up the water. Now, where do you think after they use this thing, I mean, after they, they use this thing to evidently clean up the water, where do you think they put it? Ship it to New Jersey? Take next. They put it back into the stream that you just saw that is the best trout stream in the state. And, and their regulations allow that because there's such a high water volume, the way it's explained to me, that it still meets that minimal standard that it has to meet uh, in that state. They could and, out for it. Right, to, to pollute the stream. And that what you're seeing again, what the common theme has to be here is that they don't have the manpower, A, to, to prevent. They have more punitive manpower in place, but they can't prevent this stuff and they're actually actively allowing it and they lack the regulations um, to protect the environment and, and the water courses. The other point, if you can go back to that Rue Goldberg thing, whatever it is. So this, 80% of the water, okay, that goes, that when they frack a well, 80% of the water stays down there. 80% of the industrial waste stays in the earth's surface. 20% comes out. And in Pennsylvania, they're processing it with equipment like this and then putting it back uh, into the streams. Okay, click. You can go by this one. So uh, what you're looking at here is that they're doing uh, a test um, of a, um, this is a, uh, what do you call it? You call it, um, uh, what's that? It's not a well, it's a, um, it's a spring, a natural spring. And you know, this, this man is in the middle of an area that you would literally have to, before, used to have to helicopter into, and you would have had a hard time doing that. And now, because of the runoff and because of the contamination, this natural spring is contaminated, and it also runs into a trout stream. And you know, when you're in Pennsylvania, you realize it's the sportsmen, it's the farmers, it's the private property owners that are affected. And for the, for the Republican senators upstate that are pushing this so hard, the guys that are doing this testing, and the guys that are out here fishing, and the men and women, they're called something, they're called not only fishermen, they're called your base. So the Republicans that are pushing so hard, thinking that they're focused on job creation, within five years they're gonna have constituents that are relying upon them coming very upset. And that's what has happened uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, another story about this, the regulations in Pennsylvania, because they're lax and haven't been properly adopted, when they're done with the well borings and the, the, the metal byproduct, they actually allow you to dispose of it on site. So you take all the metal casings, thousands and thousands of pounds, X number of tons, you put down a liner, you put the casings inside there, the, that industrial waste, you, you flip the liner back up, and you, you cover it with dirt on site in the middle of pristine wilderness. Well, in this case, that liner, as we've seen again and again through the process, it leaked. And those metal casings contaminated this uh, otherwise pristine, pristine source. Okay. But I think the next one you cut through. And then he's just, this is actually next to a trout stream uh, that he's, he's investigating um, where the contamination is. You can keep going. You know, people talk about the economic activity uh, and the jobs that are created. You know, th this goes into a mountain where you'd, there had never been a road before. And if you look at the size of this road, this is the type of swath that they're cutting um, into these forests. So it's not a small trail. 
this is serious industrial act activity to, to be able to take care of the type of flow of traffic that, that they're talking about. And of course that all comes, comes at an expense. If you keep going through it, this stream before was a totally free flowing stream. There would be trout fish, fishing in here. And of course, you know, this is huge disruption to the stream. Christy, keep going. Same thing. Huge culverts. People talk about uh, the, limit, the, the need to only have limited well pads. Well, you saw the dots on, on Pennsylvania, and this is just the start of it. But you're talking about a five to 20 acre site. Um, of course, total clear cutting, um, once again, industrial process. Erosion and sediment control is a huge issue. If, when you're cutting roads like that, and when you're cutting pipelines like that, and you have well pads, the, the point is, is that there are huge erosion and sediment controls. We do not have the manpower to enforce this. And to have a policy like Pennsylvania where it's punitive, where you just catch people after they've already destroyed the environment, um, is, is simply uh, irresponsible. Next. Same thing here, what, what you're looking at here uh, is, is the runoff, and I think there are a couple more pictures that are coming up that are a little bit better. Keep going, Krista. This is an example. People talk about well, the pipeline, you know, it goes under the earth's surface, don't worry about it. This is the type of cut that you're seeing through the earth's surface for thousands and thousands of miles, resulting in, in that erosion and sedimentation. You wanna keep going? And so that's the view you saw from Earth. This is the view from afar. That may actually look like a stream. There's a lot of runoff. Uh, there's a lot of water there, even looking at, at it now. Huge swaths that are cut through, through, the, um, through the countryside. And, and folks, there was nothing there previously. Next. This is looking at it. This looks like something out of Brazil, where they're, you know, where they're clear cutting. Next. Uh, and this is the type of just totally elementary, um, just get it done type erosion sedimentation control that's, that's not working in Pennsylvania. And, and there's a destruction of a wetland here. Keep going. I don't know if you can really see it, but this stream is completely mud. So any fish that were living in there are dead. The crayfish may still be alive. Bob, if you want to take off your shoes, we'll jump in there, right? Go find them. But if you were trout fishing in there last spring, you're not trout fishing in there this spring. Next. Same thing here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but all this, all this area here is all uh, runoff. And this is directly contributed to fracking. Next. Okay, so stream boring is a process where they actually, instead of going through a stream, they actually go under the stream. Um, and let me make sure that I have my, my terminology right. You wanna show the picture? So this area here, all this area right here, uh, that's Bennonite clay. And if you can show the next picture. What they have happen is they have something called frack out uh, where it actually leaches into the streams that are above. So when they go under it, they fill it up with that clay. Uh, and this is a wetland that has become completely full um, with this clay and actually filled in this wetland. Next. Same thing here. This is a, a stream, uh, Elk Creek in Tioga County, uh, where there was a frack out. Uh, and it, the, the fill that they put under that stream contaminated the stream itself. Same thing. If, if you're a trout fisherman, you look at this and it, it makes you sick. Next. I mean, these are the basic issues that he had. Um, best headwater cold water streams coincided with the Marcellus. You saw those dots on, on the map. Uh, wells are on mountaintops in the headwaters of these streams. Uh, major habitat fragmentation issues, you saw that with the ripping through the earth's surface uh, and the impact on where the stream meets the land surface of riparian buffers. Next. Okay. Um, go to the, they're just trying to show that platform on the other side. This is an example on, on regulations. This is a, a coffee dam uh, that was built. The DEP came in, they said, look, this is not gonna withstand if we have a, a, a large rain. They had a large rain nearly immediately, and this was totally uh, washed out. So all of that, all of that material now uh, is, is part of this river. Next. A couple things, I mean, we all know the, the water that's required uh, out of this. Local streams are usually too small to supply the demand. Uh, water is trans transported and stored uh, in ponds, and there are spills constantly, whether it be the fracking pools uh, or this. And the, the regulators uh, directing industry to water suppliers and streams where water is available. Next. So take a look at this picture. These two guys look like they're up to something not good, right? So 
imagine you know you, you have a country home in Pennsylvania and you see are they putting fracking fluid in the stream or are they taking water out of that stream uh, and there are constant reports on this and there's no way to know now this truck is supposed to be placard whether it's for clean water or whether it's for fracking fluid but in Pennsylvania what they're doing is that they're using the same trucks for both so one shipment will be water the next shipment will be fracking fluid you want to get your water from Pennsylvania right um, and the other issue is that they have cross-contamination and that's what they're worried about with the algae that went to southwestern Pennsylvania is that they had that uh, cross-contamination of the algae that, it, that came from uh, Texas either Texas or, or Oklahoma there have been a lot of reports of you know what are they going to do with the waste and for those who care about the environment and live in this community this is a very scary picture because there's no trust with the industry that the water's coming out and it's not going in now that said if the water is coming out that is Pennsylvania property and in New York State it's all your property and when you're talking about 10 billion gallons a day this industry is going to become one of the largest consumers of water in the state of Pennsylvania and there's no doubt that that would happen in New York State and they're doing it they take the water out it's a huge process every well they frack is about three million gallons right at, at, on average and their 80 percent stays in the earth's surface industrial waste and the other 20 percent where does it go next and this is an example of okay so this is water use in Pennsylvania so education mining can't read that one manufacturing other um, gas drilling, recreation, power generation, and water supply. And this one has been increasing every single year. And like I said, it's at that 10 billion uh, gallon mark per day. Next. It's a typical, if, if you look at the complexity and the size of that vehicle and how they're storing this water, we're talking about a huge amount of water. Next. People that don't think that this is an industrial process, the pressure that is required uh, to get beneath the Earth's surface, miles and miles beneath the Earth's surface, and crack rock. This is an intense industrial process. And uh, that's why when the Shell guy got up and he's like, well, you know, we put water in the Earth's surface and, you know, it may have a couple things in it. We just, you know, we make bubbles. That's how they try to present it. And it's a lot more complicated than that. Next. Okay. <clears throat> So on average, you have three million, every time a well is fracked, you have three million gallons on average. It says a minimum 0.1 and uh, a maximum of 8.3. Um, water brought onto that site, 84% uh, of it uh, is used. Typically 100%, well, they say a maximum of 100%. Injected water that's recovered, um, 10%. So they, they say an average of 20, but this is saying 10%. Do you understand what I'm saying on this? Okay, next. 10 billion gallons a day, all throughout Pennsylvania. And you know, honestly, my good friend at the uh, NSA wrote a paper on the fact that the wars of the future are gonna be fought not over oil, but over water. And we have gotten away for a very long time in the Northeast of having a vast supply of water. That's not so out West. Um, so this is very scary. You're talking about a, a resource that once contaminated becomes finite. Next, you can flip through that. So this is a little bit about on habitat fragmentation. Um, this is a picture of the, the moon, no, the <laughs> Venus, no. This, this is an infrared image, okay. That's a platform and you can see the pipeline. Keep going. Sorry, go. This is an infrared image from above so you can see the network, the fracking network, the pipelines and its impact on the Earth's surface, go. This is what's beginning to happen in areas that are absolutely never been touched before. This is a type of network. So they show you one image of a five acre platform, but it's, it's an entire network to the point where it looks like a, a, a heavily trafficked cul-de-sac network in a suburb somewhere. And this is massive intrusion into the, the, the water resources and their natural resources in this state. Next. Um, go next. Okay, so this is th this number. This number is 2010. The top number is 2010. Then 2011. 
in waterway encroachment. So every time you're gonna do an encroachment in the state of Pennsylvania, you have to apply for a permit, okay? So from 2010, you'll see that there are 20, and in 2011, there are about 150. The point is, is that because the pipelines are so long, you could have 300 encroachments in one um, application. But you gotta take a look at the jump. Next. Keep going. Um, keep going. I'll, I'll finish with this, um, and then we can open up to questions. And I, you know, if Bob, you can join me. Um, this is a fish kill that happened in, in Pennsylvania uh, and is happening all throughout the state. This is not Republican versus Democrat. This is this is not um, you know upstate versus downstate. This is a public safety hazard and a risk. It's an environmental risk. It's a private property assault, okay? On private, pe people that care about private property rights should be extremely concerned. This is a multi-billion dollar industry that has access, whether it be Dick Cheney or President Obama. It doesn't matter. Halliburton did great under Cheney and Bush, and guess what? They're one of the most profitable companies today under Obama. Any billionaires here? Okay, we're all in the same boat, folks. And, and they have red carpet treatment, whether it be the White House or any capital, in any state. Because money talks. Not our kind of money, their kind of money. And this issue, for me, can be potentially dangerous. Uh, when I first got on, on it, I can tell you that there's some in my conference who certainly didn't want me to get active on this issue. Um, and uh, there were a lot of pretty you know, powerful folks that were looking to really push this issue very aggressively. I can say through the hard work of a lot of grassroots activists and the community coming together and legislators like Bob Costelli that, you know, that have been working with the moratorium for a long time, we're beginning to shift the issue and the debate in the right direction. And that was not a given uh, even six months ago.